modular curves, consequences, and applications. Thank you. So my goal in this lecture is to uh, discuss the applications and the consequences of the Shimura Taniyama conjecture for the theory of elliptic curves. So, okay. So, so um, I won't be saying anything in this talk about Fermat's last theorem, but because this. Sorry? Oh, I should. Oh, large chalk. There are only small ones. Oh, I see here. Okay. I see. Are these better, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I won't say anything about Fermat's last theorem, but si since this conference was organized partly to celebrate Weil's proof of Fermat's last theorem, I thought I would begin my talk by saying a few things about the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 which is the circle of radius 1. So, as a Diophantine equation, this is very well understood. And it figured prominently in Diophantus' treatise. And it was what motivated Fermat to make his generalization for higher exponents. So, we know what the rational solutions to this equation r, namely we have a parametrization x, y equals 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared 2t over 1 plus t squared. The integer solutions are even easier. I mean there are exactly four integer solutions corresponding to these four points here. So we can, we know that there are exactly four integer solutions to this equation. Now, it's been known for a while that it's, it's quite fruitful to study Diophantine equations by considering their solutions not just over the rational numbers or over the integers, but over, ver over various fields. For example, one can also look at the real solutions to this equation. And here, there are certainly infinitely many solutions. But one measure of sort of the size of the solution set, or how many solutions there are over R, would be just the length of the circle. So I'll set n, n sub R, which is sort of the measure of a quantity of real solutions, to be the length of the circle, namely 2 pi. And also, another thing one can do is to consider the solutions to this equation over the various finite fields with p elements. So now, of course, the solution set is simply a finite set. And I'll define n sub p to be the cardinality of the solutions to, to this equation over fp. So the, number, the, so the order of the set of x, y, and fp such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. And you might ask for a formula for, for this n sub p, for the number of solutions over finite fields. Okay. So, well, for, for that, for understanding solutions over finite field of this equation, you can still use the parametrization that I have up there to uh, understand the solutions. And in fact, if you let t vary over all the possible values, 0, 1, up to p minus 1, and you also include infinity, which gives rise to a valid solution to this equation, you would get all the solutions of the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 over fp. With one important uh, thing to notice is that if minus 1 happens to be a square in fp, then there are two values of t that are invalid for this equation. Namely, you'll get twice the denominator, which is equal to 0. So depending on whether or not minus 1 is a square in fp, you have a slightly different answer. So you find that np is equal to p minus 1 if minus 1 is a square in the finite field of p elements, and is equal to p plus 1 if 
minus 1 is not a square in Fp. OK, so that's sort of explicit formula for the number of points uh, mod p, the number of solutions of this equation. However, it's not a very manageable formula because this condition a priori of whether or not minus 1 is a square mod p seems like it might be a bit subtle. So if I give you a 10 digit prime, I mean, you don't really know a priori whether, whether or not minus 1 is a square. But fortunately, we have this beautiful theorem, which is, I guess, due to Gauss, which tells us that, well, then if, well okay, a, a 2 is always a special case. So n2 you can just figure out by counting the number of solutions over f2. And then np has the following very explicit formula, is equal to p minus 1 if uh, p is congruent to 1 mod 4 and is equal to p plus 1 if p is congruent to minus 1 mod 4. So that's a much better formula than the previous one. So for example, if you have this tangent prime, you just have to look at the last two digits to know how many points uh, you have. Because you know, then you know what congruence class modulo 4 the prime lands in. So the proof of this theorem, of course, is just an application of quadratic reciprocity Or, uh, if, if, yeah, you can even make some more uh, explicit elementary proof if you want, for example, using the cyclicity of Fp star as an alternate proof. Okay, so what is this, what is this formula useful for? Well, for example, we can consider the following infinite product. product of np over p taken over all the prime numbers. Let me call this number L inverse. Now, this formula essentially allows us to come to terms with this quantity and to compute it in a precise closed form, as I'm going to show to you now. Um, Okay. Okay, so um, well, if you want to compute this, so L is equal to the product of P over NP which by this formula that we have here of Gauss is equal to the product of the primes congruent to 1 mod 4 of 1 over 1 minus 1 over p times the product over p congruent to minus 1 mod 4 of 1 plus over 1 plus 1 over p. And uh, if you expand out formally this uh, infinite product, you find that this is equal to 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh and so on. So the alternating sum of the reciprocals of the odd integers. And this we know is equal to pi over 4. And one way of seeing that is that it's the inverse tangent of 1. So we have this formula for the product of p over np. Now, if you combine this with uh, the formula that I wrote down before for n sub r, which was the length of the circle, and for the number of uh, integer solutions to the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, you find the following rather tantalizing and mysterious formula. You find that the product over all the primes of np over p times the quantity n sub r is equal to 2 times the number of integer solutions the equation. So although I gave you the proof, and it's quite simple and explicit, this formula is still very mysterious because it seems to be telling us that there's a very subtle and, and deep relationship 
between the number of solutions of this equation modulo the various prime numbers and its behavior over the real numbers. And for example, the equation viewed over the finite fields somehow knows something about the number pi, which is related to the length of the real locus. So let me very quickly discuss another example of this kind of equation. For example, let's consider Pell's equation x squared minus 2y squared equals 1. So this is an example of, of the so-called Pell's equation, which Fermat uh, liked a lot. Now we, again, as before, it follows from quadratic reciprocity of Gauss that we can write down very explicitly a formula for the number of solutions of this equation modulo the various prime numbers. And the formula is only slightly more complicated than the previous one. We know that NP is equal to P minus 1 if P is congruent to 1 or 7 mod 8 and is equal to P plus 1 if P is congruent to 3 or 5 mod 8. And since we have such a nice formula in terms of residue class of P modulo 8 for this thing, we can, do, we can do again, we can perform again this kind of calculation uh, that I did. Here. And you find when you do that that the product of NP over P is equal to 2 square root 2 over the logarithm of 3 plus 2 root 2. Well, that's a good exercise in manipulation of infinite series. Now you might try to uh, interpret this formula sort of in the spirit that I did before. Unfortunately, well, I mean, if you now ask what would be n sub r, well, this time uh, the real locus looks a bit different. This is a hyperbola with the two major axes of slope root 2 and minus root 2. So the length of that hyperbola, of course, is infinite. And the only reasonable thing you could do is to set nr equals infinity. But somewhat in harmony with this fact is the fact that the number of integer solutions, n sub z, is also infinite. Now one way to see that is that there is a fundamental solution to this equation, which is the, the solution 3, 2. 3 squared minus 2 times 2 squared is equal to 1. And in addition, this set, this, the solutions of this equation are endowed with a natural group law. Namely, I can multiply two solutions, x1, y1, with x2, y2, to get x1, x2 plus 2, y1, y2, comma, x1, y2 plus x2, y1. So this. Uh, you can check that if you start with two integer solutions of that equation and you combine them in this way, you get again an integer solution. And starting with this one, you can generate in this way infinitely many. In fact, all of them are obtained by taking powers of this fundamental one, essentially. OK, so what can you do? You don't really, so, so both these quantities are infinite, but you can observe that you have a natural map from, so let me call it phi, from x of r endowed with this st group structure that I defined here to the usual additive group of the real numbers by sending a solution x, y to the real number log of absolute value of x plus root 2 y. So this is a group homomorphism from x of r to the additive group of the real numbers. And so a natural definition of, uh, well, I mean, so these two quantities are different, but you can still meaningfully define the ratio 
nr over nz to be simply the volume or the length of the quotient phi of x of r divided by phi of x of z, so the image of the integer solutions. And uh, you, f you, know, you can see that phi of x of z, so x, I'm sorry, x is the uh, equation that I wrote down here, this Pell's equation. So phi of xz can be seen to be a set of all integer multiples of the basic quantity log of 3 plus 2 root 2. So you find that this uh, length is uh, simply the logarithm of 3 plus 2 root 2. OK. So although you can't define each of these quantities individually, you can still define their ratio in a way which is sort of natural and makes sense. And then you find that you have a desired interpretation for this infinite product, which is very similar to the one I wrote down for the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> oh, logarithm. I mean, okay. I chose the base for the logarithm, but I chose the most natural one, which is. <laughs> but does that determine the, the value of that ratio? Yeah. I mean, I chose the the standard measure on R, and I, I mean, this is just sort of for. You still got an extra root two. Oh, you're asking me what's the interpretation of this two root two? Yeah. So let me write down the formula, and then I'll. I'll, I'll maybe s try to say a few words on that. I mean, not that. It, I mean, this is just for some kind of motivation. It's not to be taken too seriously, I guess. But let me just write down the formula that you get. You find that product of n p over p times n r divided by n z. So only this ratio makes sense now. Is equal to two root two, which is also equal to root eight. So you might ask, why am I getting this funny uh, square root of eight here? And in the other formula, I was also getting a square root of four. I don't know. I mean, one explanation is that the formula for n sub p that occurred in the first equation involved a congruence modulo 4 for p. Here I'm involving a congruence modulo 8 in the formula. <laughs> so, <laughs> but. OK, so. OK, so now it's been known also since I think this is certainly something which has been used a lot in this century that there's a strong resonance between the following two problems. The first one is that of finding integer solutions, so integer points, on conics, on plane conics like uh, the two equations I wrote down, like x squared plus y squared equals 1, or x squared minus 2y squared equals 1. And the second type of problem is that of finding rational solutions to plain cubic equations like uh, the equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Or if you want, equivalently, finding integer solutions to a projective version of this equation, where you homogenize everything. Now, one reason for that is, OK, I mean, you I guess you can see a similarity between these two types of equations. If you look at the complex solutions, so over, if you look at the complex solutions of these equations, over C, this, the Riemann surface of uh, a conic equation like this one or that one looks like a uh, Riemann sphere with two points removed, so a twice punctured Riemann sphere. The Riemann surface of the projective equation corresponding to an elliptic curve, of course, as, as you all know, looks like a torus. 
And am among all the algebraic curves, these are the only two classes of, of curves which have a non-trivial abelian fundamental group. And in particular, they're the only ones that can be endowed with the structure of algebraic group in a sort of interesting way for arithmetic purposes. So there's sort of a natural reason for singling out these cubic equations for special study. OK. So now, I'm going to try to repeat the analysis that I did for, for the conics, which was quite easy, and tell you what happens in the case of these cubic equations. So let E be an elliptic curve, uh, say I write it in a wire stress form, like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, defined over the rational numbers. And let me assume for technical reasons that E is semi-stable at 3 and 5. So then, OK, so we want, to we want to sort of perform the same kind of computation that we did before with this kind of uh, equation. So of course, the first problem is to come to grips with the quantity n sub p, which is the number of points, the number of solutions to this equation modulo p. So let n p be the number of uh, solutions over fp. Here, because I'm looking at rational solutions, or if you want integer solutions on the projective equation, I'll be looking at solutions over fp defined uh, for the projective equation. So in the number of projective solutions for the projective equation. OK? So you would like to have an explicit formula sort of along the lines of the one I gave uh, before that was due to Gauss involved using quadratic reciprocity. Well, we have the following theorem, which follows from the work of Wiles, completed by Taylor Wiles, and extended, as we learned this morning, uh, by the work of uh, Fred Diamond. And so this theorem tells us, well, OK, so there exists a cusp form. f equals sum of a n q to the n, which is an eigenform for all the Hecke operators on gamma naught of n, and has uh, integer uh, Fourier coefficients. So S2 gamma naught of nz for me means a space of, of eigenforms on gamma naught of n with integer Fourier coefficients. So there is a cusp form. Uh, well, I should tell you what n is. Well, OK, I guess you all know what n is. n is the, the conductor is the arithmetic conductor of E. OK, so there is a cusp form such that n sub p equals p plus 1 minus ap, where ap is, of course, the coefficient that occurs here in this expansion. So this gives you a kind of formula for the n sub p in terms of this power series. It's of course, not as explicit as the formula I had for conics, but that's life. I mean, on the other hand, what I want to, uh, to point out is that for, this kind of, for the kind of application we had in mind of trying to understand the product of NP over P and redoing this kind of calculation, this kind of information is perfectly adequate on, on the ends of P. And, oh. So, uh, as before, let me denote by L inverse the product of NP over P, so that L, I can write, is sort of working in a very formal way, as the product of P over NP. And I can also write this as a sum 
of a n over n, where the a sub n's are exactly the Fourier coefficients of this cusp form attached by Wiles and, and so on to, to, to the elliptic curve that I started with. So the important corollary of this theorem, which is due to the work of many people, I mean, Hecke, Birch Manin, and uh, probably other people as well, I'm going to state it in a, in a kind of... So it's the following, so the expression L equals sum of AN over N converges, of course only conditionally, and it converges to a rational multiple. of a certain transcendental number, which I'll call n sub r, which is uh, defined to be the integral over the real solutions of uh, E of the differential dx over y. So this is a, a standard elliptic integral. And this, ex this infinite series, defined in terms of the reduction mod p of the elliptic curve, converges conditionally to this, to, a, to some rational multiple, not necessarily non-zero, of this transcendental number. Okay, so let me um, indicate, of course, what goes into proving something like that. So proof, well, we can define something which I've been delaying until now, we can define the L function, L of E over Q, S, by taking the sum of AN over N to the S. Now, if you don't know anything about this L function, but you know at least something about the size of the Fourier coefficients A sub N. And this is enough to know that uh, this uh, sum converges for the real part of S greater than 3 halves. And then, well, by, by Wiles, we know that this L function can be identified with the L function associated by Hecke to a cusp form of weight 2 on gamma naught of n. So we have this identity of L functions. And this, by the work of Hecke, gives the analytic continuation and functional equation for this L function, L of E over Q. In particular, we can make sense of the value of this L function for all complex numbers S. But also, something which is a little bit less known about these L functions associated to cusp forms is that the theory sum of a n over n to the S converges, in fact, for real part of S greater than 5 over 6 greater than 5, 6. So in fact, if you want to compute that, you can also evaluate the conditionally convergent sum. OK, and then once you have that, you also have an integral representation of this L function due to Birch and Manin, or maybe, uh, well, probably earlier than that also, which uh, gives you uh, this statement here that the value of the L function is a rational multiple of this period. OK. Now, of course, this number, which is essentially the product of NP over P, ought to be related in some way to the behavior of the rational solutions of, uh, of, of, my, of, the, of the elliptic curve, if the analogy with the conics can be pushed. So, What is that? 
I don't have the exact reference. I mean, I don't know who exactly proved that. I don't know if someone in the audience knows, but I can, t I can give you a reference, at least, where I read this. This is written down in a paper of Kumar Murthy. The result is not due to him, but it's written down in a paper that he wrote, which is going to appear in the sort of the rival proceedings to this one, the proceedings of the Fields Institute conference. And, and he gives, of course, a reference for who. who Okay. So, of course, the Mordal, the Mordal Vey theorem. Tells us that E of Q. First thing we, we can endow E of Q is a natural structure of, of algebraic group, and uh, with this group structure, E of Q is a finitely generated abelian group, so it's isomorphic to a certain number of copies of Z, plus a certain finite torsion subgroup. Sorry, what? Yeah, it converges conditionally, of course. Of course. I mean, so it converges absolutely for real part of S greater than three halves. Oh no, I think for all S. Actually, I think for all S. Certainly for S equals one, but I think for all. So if you want to compute L, L of E at one, just take sum of A n over N. But okay. So what would we expect? Well, motivated by this analysis that I did, very elementary analysis for conics, you would expect that the product of NP over P should be finite, precise, I mean, well, so you expect that this, uh, this quantity L, which is the inverse product of P over NP, would be non-zero precisely, or sort of morally, L should be related in some simple way to one over the order of E of Q. In particular, you would expect that L is zero precisely when E of Q is infinite. So that's what we, we kind of think, we kind of hope. So L equal to zero if and only if E of Q is infinite. And uh, okay, this is this is still very much an open question. And, uh, Okay, so I would like to, and uh, of course, this is a special case of, uh, so this is sort of the first thing. I mean, the second thing is you can try to be a little bit more precise about, about th this kind of statement. And you could say something like, um, well, so the faster this product of P over NP diverges to zero, So in other words, I mean, sort of the bigger on average that these NPs are, if this diverges to zero very quickly, the bigger R must be. The bigger R is. So this is the kind of thing that you, that you would kind of expect. And you can make this more mathematically precise. I mean, this, spe this, this, uh, speed, of uh, this speed of divergence to zero of this product uh, can be uh, encoded by saying that, that looking at the order of vanishing, at s equals 1 of the L function, L of E over QS, equals the rank of E over Q. So this is the conjecture, which is due to Birch, Sprint, and Dyer. So this statement is known as, well, as a part of the Birch, Sprint, and Dyer conjecture. That the order of vanishing of this L function, which we now know makes sense at the, at, the, at the point s equals 1 for all the curves satisfying this mild condition ought to satisfy this property that the order of vanishing gives you the rank of the Mordalvey group of the elliptic curve. So thanks to, uh, so now I want to, to talk a little bit about some work of uh, gross Aguirre and Kohli Wagen, which gives us a lot of information about this conjecture, at least in the case of curves uh, whose analytic rank is 0 or 1. So we have the following result, which is a small piece of evidence, actually, towards this general conjecture. 
And this follows from the work of Gross Aguirre, Kolivagen, So there are two parts to the statement. If the L function of E over Q, which we, well, OK. Maybe uh, let me also put Y else in here, because I'll state it for an arbitrary elliptic curve, which is semi-stable at 3 and 5. So I'm not going to put in the modularity assumption. So if L of E over Q1 is non-zero, then E of Q is finite. And the second part of the statement is that if the order of vanishing at s equals 1 of L of e over q s is exactly equal to 1, so this has a simple 0 at s equals 1, then the rank is what you would expect from this conjecture. Then the rank of e over q is equal to 1. So in other words, if the L function has a, at most a simple 0, the rank is exactly what we would predict from the Birchmitt and Dyer conjecture. So I would like to quickly give you a, a few ideas about this, uh, this result, which is a very striking result. It implies that really, in some sense, we understand cubic equations whose analytic rank is 0 and 1 about almost as much as we understand these conic equations that I analyzed at the beginning of my talk. OK, so I would like to give some idea about the proof of this result. The key idea which comes up in the proof is the notion of a Hagener point arising from a modular parametrization of the elliptic curve. Now, one of the many equivalent definitions of modularity, one of the equivalent statements of modularity, which follows from the isogeny conjecture, is that our elliptic curve is equipped with a surjective not, not morphism from the modular curve x0 of n to e. This curve x0 of n is, can be viewed as a moduli space for pairs, a goes to a prime, where, the, where, where a and a prime are elliptic curves. And the arrow between uh, this uh, a and a prime is a cyclic isogeny of degree capital N. This is a, a cyclic isogeny of degree N. Now, an important role in the proof is played by a sort of canonical system of algebraic points, the so-called Hagner points which arise from the theory of complex multiplication. So what is a Hegner point? Let me tell you very quickly. Well, if you look at diagrams, A goes to A prime, of elliptic curves with CM. Well, so I have to, let me fix a quadratic field K, quadratic imaginary field, which has the property that all the primes p dividing n are split in k over q. This is a small technical assumption that I need to make things work. It's not particularly important. So I have this. So a Hegner point is defined to be a diagram because this thing of two elliptic curves with complex multiplication by the maximal order in the ring of integers of k. So a and a prime of cm by the maximal order in k. Now, the theory of complex multiplication implies that this diagram gives rise, via the moduli interpretation, to a rational point on x0 of n defined over the Hilbert class field of the quadratic imaginary field k. So we have, so h is the Hilbert class field of k here. So now I can apply my modular parametrization to get a point on E defined over the ring class field h. So let me call this point P sub H. So I get a point P sub H, which belongs to the Mordelvé group of E over the Hilbert class field H. And let me define P sub K to be simply the trace from H down to K of P sub H. OK, now, over the last years, there's emerged a very rich picture about the relationship between these Hegner points and the arithmetic of the elliptic curve over, over various fields. So let me quickly tell you that the two main results about
So the first result is a theorem of gross laguier which tells us that essentially this uh, Hegner point, P sub k, encodes a special value of the derivative of the L function. So L prime of E over k at S equals 1 is equal to an explicit factor, which is always non-zero, times the neural state canonical height of P sub k. I should mention that in the situation in which I'm working, where I've assumed that all the primes dividing the conductor of the curve are split in k, this forces the, L, the value of the L function of E over k to always be 0. That 1 is equal to 0, and this is for parity reasons, simply because the sign of the functional equation forces a 0 of odd order. So it vanishes to order exactly at least 1. And the formula of gross Aguirre then computes the derivative of this L function in terms of the height of this canonical point, P sub k. So that's the first crucial ingredient in the proof of this uh, theorem uh, that I wrote down here. The second ingredient, oh, maybe, I, okay, I don't know. I mean, so the proof of this, I'm not going to say anything about the proof, is sort of gotten by an ingenious and quite lengthy calculation where you compute the derivative of the L function using Rankine's method, and you compute rather explicitly the, the height of the Hegner point, and you find that you get the same expression at the end. So it's ingenious and lengthy calculation. Now, the second result is the theorem of kohli wagen which says that if the Hegner point, P sub k, is of infinite order, then the rank of the Mordell Vega group of the elliptic curve over the quadratic imaginary field k, well, if it's of infinite order, of course, this rank is at least 1. But kohli wagen theorem tells us that also the rank is exactly 1. So it is an upper bound for the rank when this Hegner point is, an, is a point of infinite order. So I'm not going to, uh, of course, I'm not going to uh, explain in detail the proof here either. I would like to say a few words about the proof. I don't know, vague, a very vague idea about the proof because it's sort of an interesting argument and it has a very strong analogy with uh, Weil's argument, Weil's proof of, of uh, the modularity conjecture. So the reason for that is that, well, okay, so the, the, the main po point in the proof is that the point, the Hegner point, P sub k does not come alone. Well, we saw to begin with that it arose as a norm of a point defined over the Hilbert class field of k. So it also, it really arises as the norm of a certain point P sub h. But more generally, given any, any abelian extension, any, so given any ring class field extension, which is a certain type of abelian extension of k, let me call this field, say, L, there is also a point P sub L, which also arises from the theory of complex multiplication and from the modular parameterization of E, which is defined on the mordal weil group of E over L. So there's a whole system of compatible points defined over all these uh, abelian extensions of the quadratic imaginary field. And this, of course, is used quite heavily in the proof. Oh, actually, let me not erase this. So Wiles, in his proof of the modularity conjecture, used the fact that there is a systematic a 
sort of regular supply of deformations coming from modular forms. And from that, he concluded that all deformations are modular. And this part of his argument has a strong analogy with Kohli Wagen's argument because Kohli Wagen assumes that, well, he knows, I mean, that there's a systematic and regular supply of algebraic points defined on the elliptic curve which arise from the Hegner construction. And from this, he deduces in some sense that all rational points are Hegner, come from this Hegner construction. And okay, I mean, one can, I mean, it's sort of a bit more than a, a purely formal analogy. Somehow. Okay. So, Okay, now, given these two results, let me uh, complete the proof of this theorem of this theorem here of Grosagi and Kohli Wagen. Right. Okay, so proof of the theorem goes as follows. Well, Okay, so we have this elliptic curve over Q, and we know that it, the order of vanishing of its L function at S equals 1 is less than or equal to 1. So it has at most a simple 0. Now, by, we use an analytic result of bump freeberg hofstein murty murty or depending on the situation of waltz -Perge, which guarantees us that there exists a quadratic imaginary field K, satisfying the sort of technical hypothesis I put before that all, such that all P dividing N split in K. And with the property that the L function of E over K acquires a simple zero, acquires a zero of order exactly one. So L of E over K S has a simple zero. So then we're in a situation where we can apply the theorem of gros zagier which is here, to deduce that since the derivative of L of E over K at 1 is non-zero, then the height of this canonical point P sub K is non-zero. Therefore, the point P sub K is of infinite order. So gros zagier <laughs> implies that P sub K is a point of infinite order, is of infinite order. And now Kohli Wagen tells us that the rank of E of K is equal to 1. Okay, that's the re result that I wrote here. And then, well, I mean, so we, we know that basically the Mordal Vey group of E over K is generated by this canonical point, P sub K. And we know very explicitly what the, we know a lot about this point. I mean, it's, it's a very nice uh, conceptual construction of a point, and in particular, we know how complex conjugation acts on it. And so we know that the point lands in the right eigenspace for complex conjugation, so that we can conclude that the rank of E over Q is exactly the rank predicted by the Birchner and Dyer conjecture. So the rank of E of Q is equal to the order of vanishing at S equals 1 of the L function of E over Q at S. And this is sort of, an, uh, comes from our explicit knowledge of P sub K. So knowledge of P sub K implies this. And that completes this, this proof, which is sort of the main piece of evidence we have at this point concerning the Bertrand and Dyer conjecture for modular elliptic curves. Now let me make a few remarks about this result. So, 
So, remarks. The first remark I want to make is that for elliptic curves with CM, with complex multiplication, at least part one of the result, part one, was known much earlier, and it follows from the work of Coates-Wiles. So part one follows by, of course, a very different proof from the earlier work of Coates and Wiles. So the part one being this implication that if the L function is non-zero, then the modal vague loop is finite. The second remark I want to make is that, in fact, there's an entirely different proof of this result, which has been announced recently by Cato, uh, by Kazuyo Cato. So, so, f um, so there is a different proof. of one, which has been announced by Cato, and also looks like it's very interesting. And uh, finally, I also want to mention that this proof, this argument, can be simplified a little bit in the case where we're dealing with a semi-stable elliptic curve. So if E is semi-stable, then the argument can be somewhat simplified And in particular, well, so argument to prove one, again, not two. So argument for one can be simplified. And in particular, one can avoid invoking the gros zagier theorem. So one can avoid gros zagier OK. Ah. OK, so I want to finish now by sort of raising the two questions which seem to be the most central in the field and also certainly very difficult and tantalizing questions. What you would really like to prove, what you would really like to have, is a, criter I mean, is a criterion for when a, a cubic equation has a rational solution. The kind of uh, theorems that these methods obtained are always sort of negative, that they give criteria for an elliptic curve to not have a rational solution, or sometimes for an elliptic curve to have rank exactly one. But what you would really like to show, so, so the question which is really open, is to show that if the L function vanishes, then well, then E of Q is infinite. The rank is strictly positive. So this is a certainly wide open question, and it's certainly one of the central problems that remains to be understood. And perhaps more generally, one can ask to understand the Birchmann and Dyer conjecture for curves of higher analytic rank, which is, of course, closely related to this uh, first problem. So these problems are very interesting. They also seem to be very difficult. It seems like, at the moment, that they seem to be really beyond the range of uh, current techniques available to, to tackle this, this kind of, of problem. On the other hand, uh, two years ago, I, I thought the same thing about the Shimura Taniyama conjecture. So maybe now it's time to be optimistic and hope that uh, soon this will be solved. So uh, I'll stop here and thank you very much. <laughs>